The Allied Alpha is a carbon fiber road race bike built in Rogers, Arkansas that I've been testing here in Colorado for many months and I'm only now getting around to review because they have gone from asking me to send it back to telling me, hey, dude, you really need to send it back now. I've been dragging my feet on this a bit because I really love how the bike rides. In this review, I'll tell you why I love certain things, some things I'd like to see changed. I talk with Sam Pickman, Allied's Director of Engineering, about some of the hows and the whys of the bike. The bike is a nicely balanced mix of many things. You can see the you know, somewhat traditional seat stays coming all the way up, paired with you know, the new school internal routing for some nice visual and probably aerodynamic cleanliness. Also, Allied's got what I think is a Goldilocks solution of sorts to internal routing in that they built their own stem, also in Rogers, which allows you to take the bars off for travel, but still gives you this nice visually and most likely aerodynamically clean profile up front. Another big plus in Allied's column is the slew of choices you have from tires and tire width to your chain ring configuration, your crank links, a number of paint options all done in house there. You know, bar styles from different companies in addition to different widths and lengths. And there it's much more like a small boutique brand in terms of building each bike to order, whether you're ordering online through Allied or you're going through one of their dealers. This absolutely sets it apart from the online Bohemoth Canyon with which Allied absolutely cannot compete with on price. But you order a bike from Canyon, that sucker is gonna be stuck. Here you can dial in every last uh, little piece to your liking. Like all my bike reviews, no, this is not paid for by the company. That would just defeat the whole purpose. How this works is the bike company ships me a bike. I ride it for a while, some a little bit longer than others. Then I put it back in the box, ship it back to the company. I am able to do this thanks to the support of my sponsors like Feedback Sports, which has this sweet new 20th anniversary pro mechanic stand, which I am giving away. I just started a newsletter. You can subscribe for that in the description down below. And at the end of April, I'll pick a name at random and put this guy back in the box and ship one lucky winner this 20th anniversary pro mechanic stand from Feedback Sports, which is a family owned company here in Colorado. I tested the original Allied Rim Brake Alpha years ago, so it was fun to hop on this and see what's changed, what remains the same. Allied sells both online, direct, and through a few dealers. Prices range from $4,500 for the frame set up to $10,000 for Shimano Durace Di2 and SRAM Red Axis models. I tested the $8,000 Shimano Ultegra Di2 model. In this review, I'll talk about some comparisons. The geometry, how it compares to other road race bikes, how that affects handling and feel. We'll talk with Sam Pickman for his thoughts on a few different matters. We'll do comparisons on build, which I address the whole buffet of options you have. Talk about the company culture, manufacturing, location, and then the all important ride quality piece. You're welcome to jump ahead to any of those sections in the chapters below. Another thing some people have told me they like doing is putting the speed up to like 1.5, I guess I speak a little bit slow. So those are some options you have if you wanna jump around, but now let's just dig into my thoughts on the Allied Alpha. Let's start with numbers on the Geo chart. 73.5, it's a steep road race bike. If you like the feel of something that's quick and nimble, this is right at the alley. 32 millimeters of tire clearance. This is a huge change from say that rim brake alpha or many other road race bikes not too long ago when we were dealing with calipers and tight chain stays as a limiter this is still short chain stays, still a very snappy road race machine but you can put on plush rubber and not to jump ahead too much ahead of ourselves but boy these 30 mil victoria corsa pros whew, feel quite nice Got six size options from a 48 to a 61. This is a 56, effective top tube 56.5, so pretty straight up the middle there. Similarly, a 73 millimeter bottom bracket drop right up the middle for road race geo. So just look at the numbers, yeah, pretty darn similar to any other high-end road race bike on the market. Numbers are a small part of the story, but the construction and the story behind it is a bigger piece. And for that, I went to the guy who wrote the story, Sam Pickman, for his thoughts on what he's doing and why, what's trendy, where is 
he feel like Allied is leading? Where does he feel like consumers are leading? What's a good trend? What's a negative trend? Here's what Sam had to say. Love the I love the ride of the bike. Um, and I mean, you may have stacked the deck a bit. I'm on these 30 mil Vittorias, which are super plush. But yeah, the They're ride is nice. very nice. Very nice ride. It's um, a nice bike. It, it deserves nice tires. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I'm swapping around with you know, some different wheel sets and different tires just to see, try to tease out, you know, how much is the tires for just how much of the frame. Frame feels very comfortable without being sluggish. It does not have the drop seat stays that are in vogue. So what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on drop seat stays versus traditional? Obviously you voted for a more traditional, take it to the top, uh, you know, take it to the top tube with the seat, seat stays yeah. design. Why, why, why so? What's your thinking there? So there's a couple things kind of baked in there. One, uh, the idea around, so obviously the idea on drop stay is what everybody will tell you is it's uh, a way to add a little bit of comfort to uh, sort of aero bikes and then also kind of dropping them, um, hides them from the wind essentially, um, which is true if you're in a wind tunnel and you're not on the bike. Um, the, you know, the most, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the most important part of the bike in terms of the aero perspective is just like the very front, the front, how all those pieces interact and then how the rider interacts with the bike. Um, the down tube the seat stays, all that stuff is so minor. And I think that when you actually have a rider on the bike, it's almost impossible to tease out any difference from the stays versus um, up or down. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, aero drag. In terms of aero drag, yes, um, and I think that there are. Uh, it, I, I think to me the drop stay thing is ninety percent style. I don't love. I'm talking about from for me. I don't mm -hmm. love a, a drop stay bike looks. I think all the race bikes are starting to like you know, look like one thing. It's look like it's like they've all been designed on a spreadsheet, and it's like we gotta. Have, <laughs> this thing check, this thing check and then there's you start to um you know lose the identity or or what or, or what makes what makes one brand unique from the next what makes one bike look better than the next when they all start to kind of bleed together um and we uh we just decided to kind of make our own path and, and make a bike that we thought was beautiful and and you know from doing this for a long time, very confident that I could get the the ride feel that I wanted out of uh, more traditional looking seat stays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the ride feel is there. It's doubt. It's, it's a buttery smooth ride without feeling sluggish, which is great. It's a tricky balance to achieve. It's, how, yes. how, how do you quant or do you quantify comfort? And if so, how, you know, I think about like the, you know, the old school putting, you know, weighting up the saddle and measuring deflection or, you know, weighting the, you know, effectively the pedal spindle to measure BB deflection yep. for, for stiffness. Do you quantify comfiness? I mean, we do do all those, all of those things. Um, but you know, this stuff is not, uh, that particular part of it is not rocket science, to be honest with you. I mean, you're talking about, <laughs> you're talking about tube cross sections. If you have a very deep cross section tube, um, like a, you know, picture like a very traditional aero profile, um, it is going to be, rough, right? It's just going to bend less. Uh, and if you think about the way the load path moves through the bike, you're talking about your top tube, your seat tube and your seat stays are kind of like the most important areas for that. And so if you're able to slim down the top tube near the seat tube, you're able to keep your seat tube, not super, super deep. You're going to be able to achieve a pretty nice, uh, a pretty nice ride feel. There are things that you can do with layup, uh, that, that can help with that. But really the shape is the number one driver for, for the comfort. Yeah. 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 And it looks sweet. Yeah. Thank you. Let's talk about fit. The yep. speaking of things that are looking sweet, the, your allied stem looks fantastic. It hides the brake hoses. And if it's a DI2 bike, the, the digital line, you can't adjust up or down once the steer is cut. So how do you work with your customers to make sure that their fit is, perfect before they order this machine. Oh, okay. Well, it's not totally true. You can go down. Um, so we have a, a um, steer tube cutting 
jig that we worked with Abbey tools on where you just essentially slide a tube over to protect the cables and you can cut around the steer tube. So you just mm -hmm. have to unbolt everything. Uh, you can leave your hoses connected um, and you can trim down. Okay. Okay. Uh, we do also offer to customers who are very unsure of if the fit is going to work for them um, a half cap. So basically you can, uh, so, we'll send so you, you can have spacers on top. Exactly. And you yes. can adjust your mm. fit as you like. And then if, um, if uh, you want to go up or down, you can do that. And then once you cut it correct, you're set. You can't go up anymore. Um, right. We do offer a zero and a negative six. Those are the two angle options for stems. So if you did cut it and you were like, oh man, I went too low, you can't swap the stem. <laughs> okay. Um, and the stem swap for us is you don't have to recable the bike. So the gap in the back of the stem is large enough for you to be able to pull the um, stem off and put a new stem right on without having to recable the bike. So stem length and stem angle you can change with you know, a very, very short change, 15, 20 mm -hmm. minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then what do you recommend folks do when traveling with the bike? So I travel with mine all the time. You just have to undo the cap, um, take the handlebars and move them to the side like you normally would. Um, I travel with an evoke bag, uh, just the, whatever their most recent one is. I mm -hmm. even have an old one. It's essentially the same has changed. And I just leave the stem on and it fits just fine i ride a big bike too so um i do not pull the stem i just leave the stem attached um take the cap off move the handlebars and uh, fix them to the side of the frame like the uh you know top tube down tube they have a little they basically have a little thing for that sure so there's there's enough slack in the brake hoses that when you leave the stem attached you can pull the bar out and have enough movement to correct so yeah. i travel with mine my wife is a shorter stem so she has less cables obviously to work with yeah and we both we, we travel with them all the time okay great yeah no further questions your honor <laughs> <laughs> i mean the thing is is that i think that the the internal cable routing debate is a good one you know i think that for better or for worse, the industry has moved in that direction and, and the customer sort of demands it. I think it's a, it's a interesting, you see a lot of chatter about it online, but the, the, the industry is not the one that has made the decision to do this, right? The customer has made the decision. They have decided, the market has decided, we don't want to see cables anymore. Yes, right? this looks cool. And, I want this. Exactly, exactly. And yeah. so it's, it is, um, it's up to us to try to figure out ways to make this, you know, user friendly, be able to do the adjustments that people expect, but there is, there is without a doubt going to be a curve as the industry gets to a point where everybody is now comfortable with these things. And it's the same thing with everything, right? When disc brakes are first introduced, it took a while to sort of, you know, the industry to work out the kinks and also people just get used to working on them. Same thing with electronic drivetrains, all these things, right? New technologies require new tools, new understanding, and just like a shift from both the industry and the customer on expectation of what it is to work on and live with a bicycle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we really, listen, we try super hard to make these bikes uh, easy to live with. You know, the sort of, sort of one of my uh, taglines when I was designing the Alpha was the your sort of daily driver supercar. So it's a bike that that rides like a, you know, crazy super bike, but you can live with it every single day. You can ride it every day. It's comfortable. You can work on it for the most part. And it's just nothing is crazy on it. Um, and, you know, it's a big focus for us is to try to make bikes and parts that, you know, with some instruction that uh, just about anybody can live with and work on. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Nice work, Sam. Thank you. Now let's talk price comparisons. Allied, surprisingly, for a made-in-the-U.S. bike is relatively competitive. Is it cheap? No. Heck no. High-end bikes are, not, are nowhere near cheap these days. But let's look at co some comparisons like, you know, Giant's new TCR Advance SL, which recently came out, which I test rode. And then on the, you know, cheapest end of the high-end, Canyon, right? That's the 
That's the 800 pound gorilla. So let's look at pricing there. For that giant TCR advanced SL frame starts at 3,500 bucks and it goes all the way up to $12,500 for complete bikes. You can, thanks to Giant's wide range, get complete bikes for as little as $3,500 with Shimano 105 groups. On the other end, you've got the Canyon Ultimate. You can get a complete Ultimate CFSL7 for 2,800 bucks with Shimano 105. And then Canyons go all the way up to 10,005 with Shimano Durace Di2 and SRAM Red. So at the top end, the prices there are the same. Now, very much unlike Canyon and Giant, who assemble their bikes, put them in the box, and ship them as stock around the world, Allied is putting its bikes together one at a time based on your order. And that way, it's very much like a boutique high-end brand. They're kind of in a unique space here, is how much of that has to do with them being owned like Rafa by the Waltons of Walmart fame? I don't know, but it is a differentiator for sure in addition to the you know, Made in America piece with the carbon frames and the alloy stems. Here's some examples of the level of spec choice you have. For wheels, you can do Zip, Industry 9, Envy in a variety of configurations. For tires, you've got three Vittoria Corsa options by model, and then you can get either 28s or 30s. Here to tell you, these 30s, man, they feel nice. You can do chainring configuration, crank length, stem length, stem angle, bar width, type of bar, whether that is a black ink like came on this bike, FSA or Envy. Even headsets, you can get a wolf tooth or a Chris King option for this internally routed configuration. If you're buying direct, you can even get a few different types of look pedals and Arundel cages. And the paint piece, you've got more than a dozen paint options, all done there in-house in Rogers, Arkansas. In some ways, excluding that paint piece, the closest comparison for US buyers might be the brand that used to be called Fazari and now is just called Ari. And there you can specify a few things like crank length, chain rings, bar stem setup. So there are a few doing this, but it is very much the exception and not the rule. So does a brand building its own bikes in-house like Allied make for a superior experience for you as a rider? in terms of ride quality compared to a brand like Specialized or Trek that does the engineering in-house and then buys the manufacturing part from a factory. There's certainly arguments to be made on both sides of that. I certainly appreciate being able to see how and where stuff is made, whether that was at the giant factory tour I did in Taiwan last month or in Rogers, Arkansas, where Sam gave me a tour last year. You can check out that video for a look inside how Allied makes his bikes. And I'll tell you, I've never seen couscous involved. Sam says it's a fairly common thing, but that was a new one to me. Now let's get down to what it's all about. The hokey pokey. But no, I mean ride feel. Let's talk ride feel. I've been yammering about these tires. I'm gonna yammer some more. When I first get on a bike, there's a few things that I notice right off. And the tire configuration is one of them. What types of tires there are on, how wide, and what the air pressure is. That can make a huge difference. You know, I was just in the wind tunnel uh, testing a couple different bikes, and even there, riding on the rollers, not even pedaling, like having the bike fixed and just feeling different tires at the same speed of the rollers with the same air pressure, some tires feel better than others. Once you get into high-end tires, it's kind of like high-end road bikes, like the differences are very small, but going from a meh tire to a really nice tire, that's absolutely something you can feel. So Allied certainly stacked the deck here <laughs> with a super plush, you know, cotton casing tire. Uh, I like the Specialized tires quite a bit that Victoria also makes. You may notice a similarity in how the two look. That's because they're coming out of the same place. These are good tires. They aren't the most robust things in the world. Of course, that's part of the trade-off you get when you get a really supple, soft tire is it's not gonna be you know, like a gator skin, you know, right through a bucket of glass and not flat type situation. So that's, that's like an instant feel thing. 
Obviously that's not limited to the bike itself, but that's just a big part of feel. Another thing is the contact points. Like how does the saddle feel? How do the bars feel in terms of the, not just the shape, but the configuration to how I'd like to set up my geometry. Got on a Colnago super high zoot gravel bike recently and was riding with the engineer, David Humagalia, and he was like, hey, what are your first impressions? I'm like, I don't know, man. It feels like I'm sitting up like Mary Poppins because we can't change the integrated bar stem without a lot of brain damage, you know, redoing brake lines. So being able to have geo that's set up to your liking, to my liking, makes a huge difference in how the bike feels. It could be, you know, the best on paper super bike in the world. And if something feels off to you, it's not gonna feel great. So that is how having a variety of stem links and bar widths can make a huge difference. And no, you don't need to spend $8,000 to get that. You can do that on a $1,000 bike, right? In many ways, cheaper bikes are much easier <laughs> to dial in because they've got traditional stems and bars and you can just swap it out so you get your fit right. And that is the key point to any bike is making sure the thing fits you. The cranks came as 170s, so I swapped out some 172s. Having all my fit coordinates set puts me in the happy place and then I can start paying attention to things like how stiff is the bottom bracket? How quickly does it accelerate? You know, what's the front end handling like? What's the comfort like from, yes, the saddle, but also the seat post and maybe a tiny bit of the frame. There, I feel like it's a super balanced road race machine and that, I mean, there's small differences that can be measured in a lab, right? Like back at Venus, back in the day, we did some torsional stiffness and lateral stiffness test similar to what Tour Magazine in Germany does, you know, of trying to tease out the tiny differences from one high-end frame to another high-end frame. And yes, you can measure those differences. Can you feel those differences on the road? Seldom. I think we're kidding ourselves when we're, you know, if it's like a 2%, 1%, less than 1% difference. But when it's, you know, going from an endurance bike where comfort is the main thing to a race bike, where it's different, yeah, you can feel the difference. And then it's a matter of preference. How do you want it to feel? There's no such thing as an objective good, but there is such a thing as how you like a bike to feel. I like bikes that feel light and lively and quick to accelerate, but don't beat me up. That's where I knit out, and this nails that. Feelings, let's talk about more feelings, like acceleration. And not just sprinting, like how many of us are sprinting for finish lines these days. Even those of us who enjoy recreational racing or just going for the town line sprint, that's a tiny bit of our reality on the bike. But accelerating the bike away from a stop sign or a stop light or you know, leaving your home or garage, that's something you do every time you ride multiple times. And a bike that does that quickly feels good. So that's you know a combination of you know, rotational mass and the bottom bracket area stiffness, this bike feels delicious in that aspect. Then once you're up and rolling, how does it feel? How does it sound? Well, one thing I like about the you know, fully internal bikes these days is they look clean and there's also just less stuff to whistle in the wind. Some internal routings can get it wrong that you can hear cables thwapping around like either in the cockpit or in the head tube. This, thankfully, does not <laughs> suffer from that. Riding this on group rides, whether it's a fast lunch ride or the longer super training rides that are held here in Colorado monthly, this guy feels great. Some of that is the deeper Industry 9 wheels, for sure. Aerodynamics is a thing. A lot of that is positioning. Neither of those are unique to this bike by any means, but I gotta tell you, one thing I love about riding gravel is how good it makes it feel when you get on a high-end road race machine. Because man, these things like to go and go quickly and with very little effort, relatively. And then coming downhill at speed. Yes, a lot of that is body positioning and your preference for what a head angle is, but having my geo dial on this just felt super confident and nimble at the same time. You know, some bikes, you know, if it's a slacker bike, feels pretty steady, but uh, it can be not hard to change direction, but it just takes a little bit more input. 
This takes very little input, but doesn't feel like it's skittish. Again, it's like a nice, good, well-balanced road race bike. Is a road race bike right for you? I don't know, but I do know two things that you should consider. One is head angle, what feels good to you. And two, the height of the head tube. You know, what positioning feels good to you? If you don't know the answer to that, that's absolutely fine. And this is where bike shops are your friends. You can do online research for sure, but nothing replaces talking to a knowledgeable person who can help you get fit on a bike so you can get an understanding of what is a good set of dimensions for your body and your preference. And yes, there are other differences between a road race bike and an endurance bike or what is often being called an all road bike now. But a couple of those primary differences are what's going on at the front end, like how low or high it is and how steep or slack it is. What would I change? Well, as you can probably tell, I quite like this bike. And most of my gripes are just centered around the saddle. Celitalia Novus Boost, I love the shape of the thing, but the edge where the padding meets the carbon shell makes for like a little stiction point. So like every time I get out of the saddle or get back in, there's just like a little bit of like weird friction. And then this funky design in the back, is cute and all, but makes it difficult to put on a lot of saddlebags. So small gripes. And yes, that's not like it's welded to the frame. You can very easily swap out a saddle or just have the folks at Allied put on a new saddle for you. So that's my main gripe. The seat post that is you know, designed just for this frame is something that's pretty common now across high-end bikes. The plus side is it's you know visually integrated, so it looks sweet. Engineers will give you their list of reasonings and that they can tune the seat post to work in conjunction with the frame, whether that's for a bit of flex or for aerodynamics, all fine and good. Downside is that should you want to swap it out, you are very limited at best. So in sum, the Allied Alpha is in my humble estimation an excellent road race bike. It's a fun mix of some old school thinking with a lot of new school technology and new school design, all made down in Rogers, Arkansas. Unlike the larger brands that have a very set order of good, better, best bikes, here, like a boutique brand, you've got a whole buffet of options where you can tweak all the various components to your liking. And you can choose from a pretty nice selection of paint jobs that are also done in Rogers, Arkansas. Unlike other boutique brands, though, the Allied Alpha is competitive to those big brands. Not as competitive as Canyon, for sure, but certainly in line with the Treks and the Specialized and the Giants of the world. I have really enjoyed riding this bike, and I am sad to see it go. But yes, Sam, I'm going to put this back in the box right now. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And whether you're riding a bike from Arkansas or from Asia, I hope you enjoy the ride.